This article tacitly admits that the gospel of the Seventh Adventist Church is a different gospel. It isn't what Jesus revealed to the apostles, which was handed down by them through the centuries to the present day. Instead, it's the novel pillar doctrines of the Adventist Church nestled under the borrowed label of the everlasting gospel. And if one takes umbrage with this, it will be seen as you not wanting to obey Jesus and live a transformed life. How convenient, right? What's up, YouTube? As always, welcome to the channel. So today we're kicking off a series of videos around the cardinal doctrines of the Christian faith and examining Seventh-day Adventism in light of those. This first series is focused on the gospel. In Romans 1, 16 through 17, Paul writes this. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, but the righteous will live by faith. So at a granular level, much information is packed into these two verses, much of which he expounds upon further in the following chapters. He tells us that it's the gospel that is the power of God for salvation to everyone that believes it, to both Jews and Gentiles alike. It has a transcendent quality to it. It isn't tied to one people group or another, nor is it tied to only a specific generation of people. It doesn't morph or change based on what time period you live in. Further evidence of this is found in Paul's epistle to the Galatians, where in the first chapter he writes, I marvel that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But if we, or an angel from heaven, should proclaim to you a gospel contrary to the gospel we have proclaimed to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is proclaiming to you a gospel contrary to what you received, let him be accursed. So it needs to be stated boldly and plainly, there is only one gospel that saves. This gospel that is the power of God unto salvation cannot be altered. Nothing can be added to it or taken away, or it is no longer Christ's gospel, but a different one, which also means it cannot save because only Christ's gospel is the power of God unto salvation. He then places a double curse on those who proselytize a false cursed gospel by saying, let them be anathema, which means damned. He goes on in Galatians 1 to explain that he didn't receive this gospel from man, but from Jesus Christ himself. The apostle Apostles had the true gospel revealed to them by Christ, and they then passed this gospel down through the centuries to the present day. It has not changed, it has not taken a new form or shape to fit in our current day and age, it did not disappear and need to be restored. So in this series, we're going to examine a number of aspects of the Seventh-day Adventist gospel in light of Jesus Christ's once-for-all gospel. So to start, in 1 Corinthians 15, 1-8, Paul gives us an excellent overview of Christ's gospel. He writes, now I make known to you, brothers, the gospel which I proclaimed as good news to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I proclaim to you as good news, unless you believed for nothing. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he also appeared to me. So the core of the gospel is that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was resurrected on the third day according to the scriptures. He was seen by many eyewitnesses, including all of the 12 disciples and Paul the apostle. To get even more specific and precise, the gospel is this. Man has broken God's law, and our sin has separated us from our Maker. In His grace, God entered into His own creation in the person of Jesus Christ, born of a virgin, and lived a perfect and sinless life, fulfilling all of the law's demands, on a mission by God the Father to save sinners from condemnation. He paid the penalty for sin which is death, and bore the sins of His people in His body on a cross, making propitiation by His blood. He died, was buried, and resurrected in the same body He died in, on the third day for our justification. By a living faith in the person and work of Jesus, God graciously declares a person righteous, they are reconciled to their Creator, sealed with the Holy Spirit, and have peace with God. They are born again of the Spirit, adopted into His family, and are granted eternal resurrection life in Jesus Christ, set free to do good works that please Him. Jesus will physically return one day to judge the living and the dead, but His people will be spared from the wrath to come to dwell in union with God forever. That is the gospel revealed by Jesus Christ to the apostles that they then penned down in the scriptures and has been handed down to us today. So now, let's look at how the Seventh Avenue his faith and message lines up with this. The mission statement on their website reads as follows. Make disciples of Jesus Christ who live as his loving witnesses and proclaim to all people the everlasting gospel of the three angels' messages in preparation for his soon return. 
So the Gospel of Adventism has been branded with the term the Three Angels' Messages. The more common phrase you'll hear them use for this is the Everlasting Gospel, a phrase that is found in Revelation 14.6. They also state this in their official exposition of their own beliefs. It says, the prophecies of the book of Revelation clearly lay out the mission of the remnant. The three angels' messages of Revelation 14, 6 through 12, reveal the proclamation of the remnant that will bring a full and final restoration of the gospel truth. So using a historicist approach to the book of Revelation, they think that the 14th chapter is saying the fullness of the gospel fell away and that in the end times, God would raise up a remnant of people who would restore it, obviously referring to themselves as the remnant. They also claim, as Ellen White did, that the angels are representative of themselves. They're supposedly the ones heralding these messages to the world. We know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the everlasting gospel of Revelation 14 is not different than the gospel revealed to the apostles, as we've already seen that there is only one gospel of Jesus Christ and all others are cursed. The everlasting gospel is not different than what Jesus had already revealed to the apostles of which John was one of. So how is the Adventist church defining this everlasting gospel? In a 2001 paper titled, What is the Everlasting Gospel? Adventist theologian Herbert Douglas said this, this everlasting gospel focuses on one, God to whom worship and obedience are due, and on two, a people who give glory to him during the time of his judgment. Why is this emphasis on the everlasting gospel so timely, so important, so necessary? Apparently there was something about the gospel that had been muted or muddled for some time before the events seen in Revelation 14, requiring this special heavenly intervention to set matters right, especially at this foretold time of his judgment. So quickly, in passing, I want to note something. In the next paragraph, he says, quote, A brief overview of church history for the past 200 years highlights a remarkable confusion regarding the gospel that has existed since apostolic days. He continues in the same paragraph by asking the question of where one would find the gospel during the Reformation era, showcasing the Adventist church's lack of understanding around actual church history. The reformers did not claim that the gospel was lost and needed to be restored. It's always been here. Christ's gospel will never be extinguished. Remember, it's the power of God under salvation for all that believe it. If it became truncated, that means it disappeared and the power of God unto salvation was lost for a time. Keep this in mind as this is an important concept in the Adventist understanding of the gospel. He continues by saying, if the gospel includes more than telling the story of Christ's death, what is that something more? And why was an end time correction needed in order for God to get his final message across to seekers of truth before Jesus returns? So notice, in the Adventist worldview, the gospel disappeared, became distorted for a long period of time, and is supposedly being restored to its fullness by the Adventist church and the unique end times message that they are heralding. Throughout this paper, which I'll link to in the description box, he misrepresents historic Christianity with the common SDA claims like no one else teaches obedience to God or that one experiences a transformed life when they come to Christ, which is so unbelievably false, I don't even know where to start. But in the final paragraph of the paper, we read this. The purpose of the gospel is to make plain why Jesus came and why he died. The everlasting gospel in the end times restores the New Testament gospel in its wholeness, in its integrity. It explains God's plan to save men and women in such a way that their presence in the new earth would not jeopardize again the well-being and security of the universe. So if you read this paper, you're going to see that he makes a differentiation between what he calls limited gospels and the everlasting gospel of the end times that the Adventist church is supposedly restoring and heralding to the world. He says that these limited gospels only focus on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, omitting the aspect of a transformed life and obedience to Christ. To which I say again, what utter nonsense? And secondly, in the words of Paul the Apostle, I'm determined to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. So is that it? A trans transformed life and obedience, that's all that the SDA church is restoring? That's what supposedly fell away and needed restored in the end times? What do they mean by this? He doesn't get into the finer details, so we have to go to another source for that. In the November 29, 1934 issue of Review and Herald, we find the specifics where it says, this movement with which we are connected stands for certain great fundamental truths. The existence of God, the inspiration of the Holy Scriptures, salvation alone through the vicarious sacrifice of the Lord Jesus, repentance, regeneration, and the gift of righteousness by faith, the work of the Holy Spirit, the immutability of God's law, the binding claims of the Bible Sabbath, the priestly ministry of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary, the investigative judgment now going on, the soon coming of Christ to take his children home, the doctrine of spiritual gifts, the manifestation of the gift of prophecy in the remnant church, life only in Christ, Christian temperance, and other leading important Bible doctrines. These great truths constitute the everlasting gospel message for this time. They continue in the next column by saying, 
To the Seventh-day Adventist Church has been committed this message. The everlasting gospel was preached by Noah, by Abraham, by Paul and Peter, and by all the prophets and apostles of past ages. It was preached in the setting appropriate to their day. We cannot preach this gospel message as Noah preached it or as Paul or Luther gave it. It is for us to preach it in the setting of God's great threefold message of Revelation 14. Luther preached righteousness by faith in the setting of the gospel message for the 16th century. We must preach righteousness by faith in the setting of God's message for this time. We are told by the messenger of the Lord, quoting Ellen White here, several have written to me inquiring if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message, and I have answered. It is the third angel's message in verity. The apostle Paul preached of righteousness and temperance and of a judgment to come. We cannot preach the judgment of God as did the apostle. We must preach the hour of his judgment is come. That judgment is now going forward. The great underlying principles of these truths are the same, but in our preaching, their application must be made to present day conditions. And then down on the next page is a quote from Testimonies for the Church Church, volume 6 by Ellen White, which says, No line of truth that has made the Seventh-day Adventist people what they are is to be weakened. We have the old landmarks of truth, experience, and duty, and we are to stand firmly in defense of our principles in full view of the world. So here we're given a clear outline of what all this everlasting gospel supposedly entails, among a host of beliefs that they have borrowed and redefined, such as righteousness by faith, a topic for another video, we also find Adventist pillar doctrines, such as the Seventh-day Sabbath, which they call the Bible Sabbath, the investigative judgment, the work of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary, which is a part of their atonement model, and the gift of prophecy manifested through Ellen G. White, who we saw a quote from regarding these pillars, where she said Adventists have the old landmarks of truth and they are never to be weakened, which is rather odd considering that these are doctrines that are for this time to be preached in this setting, but at the same time they are supposedly restoring apostolic Christianity. Right. This was followed up by them saying that this message cannot be preached the same way that others have through the centuries because those people didn't live in our setting. You're also seeing the Adventist doctrine of present truth on display here, which is really just relative truth. So this article tacitly admits that the gospel of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is a different gospel. It isn't what Jesus revealed to the apostles, which was handed down by them through the centuries to the present day. Instead, it's the novel pillar doctrines of the Adventist Church nestled under the borrowed label of the everlasting gospel. And if one takes umbrage with this, it will be seen as you not wanting to obey Jesus and live a transformed life. How convenient, right? And this gets us back to what I was saying earlier about the assumptions that the Adventist church brings to the table. It's important to understand these. The assumption that the gospel fell away for a period of time and needed restored. A claim that all the restorationist groups make. The assumption that the gospel proclamation looks different at different periods of time and isn't a unified, transcendent, definite message. The assumption that church history spans no more than a mere 200 years into the past and the lack of understanding around the Reformation and what the real issues were. The assumption that different denominations all claim to have have different gospels and you have to find the right one like a needle in a haystack no pun intended, and a plethora of others that we will explore along our journey down this rabbit hole. The gospel of Jesus Christ never disappeared. It never got lost or needed restored. Jesus Christ possesses all authority in heaven and on earth. This is the authority that the disciples were sent out with in Matthew 28 to take the gospel to the nations. In the next part of this series, we will begin dissecting this false gospel angel by angel, starting with the first angel's message. If you found today's video helpful, would you please be so kind as to smash that like button, subscribe, and ring the notification bell so you can be notified when the next part is uploaded. As always, until next time, God bless.